Hi everybody, Adam Steele here, and today I'm going to be talking about this thing from Kali Audio. Now this video is technically sponsored by Kali Audio because they have sent me this, so we're going to try and show you what it does and why it does it and how it does it, rather than it being a review of is this good or not, because I can't really say I, I'm being sent this to do a video on. So without further ado, here we go. I suppose the first question is, what is this funny looking thing? Because it's got two speakers that quite weighted are these little balls, and it's got this big chunky thing at the back. Well, it's oh, the size, size of this thing. It's technically a 2.1 system because it's got two tops, as it were, and a subwoofer. It behaves as if it was stereo, though. It's a monitoring system. It, it's one of those kind of things that you would use if you're a recording engineer and you need to mix something because it's going to be aiming to be brutally honest. I'll find out when I install this whether it is brutally honest or not, but that's something I'll find out later. First question is, would, would I use something like this in here? And the answer to that is no, definitely not. This is underpowered for a professional studio. This is not for that. It's, it's not designed for that. But what it is designed for is if you're at home, you're one of those, those people who's got a small mix room, you've got a very tight space to work in, and traditional monitors like these, oh, or the ones you see behind me, the Kali in fives, the IN fives, which I'm going to do a whole separate video on because they're there to do with the Dolby Atmos setup. These are massive. And in a space like mine, or like a lot of you would have at home, they are unreasonably big and a, as a result, very difficult to put in the right kind of place. And the alternatives that you can get are usually really small and as a result, don't have very much low end extension and can still be quite awkward to place. Enter the oomph, <laughs> the ultra near field from Kali Audio. Now, when these were announced and I saw them, um, cause it's been a little while since they were announced, a memory was unlocked from when I was a kid. I had one of these. It's an old MacBook. Yes, it's got googly eyes. It's not a MacBook, it's an iMac. It's the old iMac with the kind of the, the cheeky thing. And we got the kind of the, the posh premium package, which came with these little ball shaped speakers. And these went on the desk. And for the time, because we're talking really early 2000s here, they sounded incredible. As long as you didn't push them too loudly so they started to distort, they were really kind of full sounding and clear sounding compared to anything else you could get at the time without spending crazy money. Uh, I think it's partly because the design meant that these, instead of being up here somewhere and reflecting sound off the desk and all that kind of stuff, they, they harnessed the desk to kind of give extra low end kind of perception and not give you much reflection and that's how boundary microphones work. You know, the kind of the Pitso flat mics, or you'll see the Shure Beta 91. Um, they go on a desk, so there is no reflection, so they sound clear. That's the theory. And that's what they did here. And I've had this, and I've had this nearly 20 years, and for its time, it sounded great. It doesn't sound great now, and it's dirty as all hell, but that's just technology marching on. So this system, so this system kind of starts there with these two big ball speakers, which again, I've seen the round uh, speaker design before uh, with things like the SE Electronics and Munro Egg, which was a, an egg shaped monitor, which meant that there were no kind of boxy reflections because um, a square box can cause modes and, and kind of vibrations between panels and all that kind of stuff. If there are no flat surfaces, that can't happen. So between this and what looks like kind of rubber pucks to really stop these moving around and stop the desk vibrating, the theory seems to be 
that these uh, go quite close to you, really close to you, and fire up at your ears. So the sound essentially comes from the desk. So there is no reflection before it hits your ears, at least. So it seems the idea is to kind of eliminate as many of the negatives that you will find in a difficult situation as possible. Now the specs on this are okay, but this is not several things. This is not a super loud, like massive midfield monitor system. This is designed to replace near field monitors. Even those eaves that I had on here are probably quite a bit louder and more boomy than this is gonna get. I mean, the sub for this, yeah, it's quite big, but it's it's not that big. It's also not something that you would use if you want to have several people sat around it because the, I would imagine the stereo field on these is not gonna be kind of, there's gonna be a very small sweet spot. Uh, let's put it that way, because if, they, if both of these are to be put on a desk pointing exactly at me, if I move, I'm gonna get decent sound, but the stereo image isn't gonna be perfect. And of course, most of the people using these are probably going to be using them in rooms that are either not treated at all acoustically or very badly treated. And yes, I'm talking to you that's stuck a bit of foam on the wall and think that that's acoustic treatment. It's 10% of the way there. Yes, I have foam on the walls, but we also spent a huge amount of time and engineering effort that you don't see with floating walls, floating floors, floating ceilings, non-parallel walls, etc, etc. Now, where I can use this is at home in my mix room, which I also call Studio B. I have, for the entire time that I've lived there, only been able to mix on headphones in there. And I'm I may mix on these, uh, we'll see. I'll definitely be using them as a check reference. Uh, and I'll be using these during the day to do things like uh, editing, trimming files, you know, just listening and doing all the stuff where I don't necessarily want to have a pair of cans strapped to my head. And I'll be able to do things like track guitars without having to have extra wires attached to me. That kind of stuff, as long as I can trust these enough with how good the sound is for what I'm trying to do, these might fill a niche. So, without further ado, over to Studio B, where you're gonna see me talk through the installation of these and what you have to do to get them right for your room, and then see what I get with first impressions and what these can do and what they can't. So this is Studio B, this is my home mix room, and as you can hear, it's kind of untreated and quite echoey. Um, we were renting this house and we've, we've recently uh, bought the house, massive thanks to everyone on Patreon and guys like Warren Hewitt that really helped me out to, to do that. Uh, but that meant that up until now, my only choice was to use headphones, uh, which I would then have to go into the studio and check everything. And now I couldn't wait, I, I have the box here, but I got these installed straight away because I, I got these home, I didn't have the camera for a couple of days, and I was like, right, let's go. And so, here it is. You can't really see the sub because screen number one here is a 32 inch uh, 4K screen, which I use a lot for editing. And so that meant that things were a little bit complicated. So I tried with the, uh, the base pack lying flat and it was kind of making the desk resonate too much. So I stood it up and I dipped the dip switch. And the two pucks here with the speakers on, they're kind of, go in here, so they're just arm's length. Maybe I'll put them a little, yeah, a little further back if I can, and I can. So that is where they go, and they are pointing at my ears. The tweeters, I don't think I mentioned before, the tweeters are actually, actually coaxial, they're in the middle of the mid-range driver. So there is a high-end tweeter in there, uh, which means that I'm getting all the top end. I installed that, and because this is in the corner of a room, I had to use the, uh, the setting on the dip switches that is uh, corner, because otherwise it was really boomy. And then I listened to them and it sounded a bit, especially in this room, like the top end was a bit dark on the, the monitors. But there are EQ switches for that, so I switched the switches to lift that by 2 dB. Next thing, 
is going to be Sonarworks. But my, my first impression is these things are really good for getting a general idea of what's going on. Are they as good as like NS10s and a subwoofer? No. Um, but they that would never fit in a space like this. I mean, look at this desk. There's, there's no space, it ends here. I couldn't put a monitor there. If I put one there, they'd be way too wide. They'd take up so much space. They would be completely impractical. I'd have to either remove a screen, which I need at least two screens for productivity, or I'd have to have some ridiculous screen tower and break my neck. Uh, because one of them's for streaming, one of them's for kind of video playback, and one's for uh, the mixing or editing, whatever it is I'm doing on any given day. But yeah, I tried these out and they are really impressive as long as you're not trying to go crazy loud. As soon as the volume gets to a, like a loud kind of ow kind of point, not only are they a tiny bit distorted, but more than anything, the room and the desk that it's on start vibrating in sympathy and causing more issues than anything. But that is exactly the same as if you were using near field monitors or anything like that. It's just physics. I think the next thing I'm gonna do in this room is I'm going to put some acoustic treatment up. But even if I had already done that, this is pretty much the only option for me to get kind of a full range system in here at any volume level. So this is really great. I mean, not only for the money, but I can't think of any other solutions that have the kind of low end extension that this does. It comes with these paper guides, which uh, you can put down and then you put the base uh, down on it, uh, the base unit down, and then you can work out from there where your satellites are supposed to go. So my satellites are a little bit further forward than they should be on these, but that's because of the physical limitations of the screen. So I brought them about three inches further forward than they should be on paper. But that seems to have kind of done the job. I physically can't move the base pack any further because of the foot on this stand. I really don't want to have to visa mount this, this monitor, but worst comes to worst, that might be what I do. And then I've got more uh, room to bring the, the base pack further forward. So it's away from the wall a bit more. Uh, it's closer in terms of uh, phase alignment. But for now, I mean, I'm not running this in crazy volume. I'm running the ID24 from Audience. That's actually coming out to my balanced headphone amp from Sheet Audio, which I'm purposefully mispronouncing. And that's also being kind of doubled up and fed to the bass pack over a balanced XLR to TRS. So it's a balanced path the whole way. And that also means I have an attenuation knob here, which means I don't have to reach for the volume, but the volume I can reach under my uh, monitor here if I have to. It's a little awkward. If it was laid down, that would be much easier. But I did notice a funny thing that uh, with the sleep mode engaged, um, if the inputs were getting hit quite loud, there was kind of a tick, 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 tick kind of sound, uh, which uh, just by turning them off completely, uh, that wasn't an issue. And I have easy access to the on and off switch, which for my strange use case of having uh, this looped through a headphone amp, that's an easy solution uh, that isn't crazy to access. So yes, Kali Audio did send me these to check out and to, to demo, uh, so I am biased, but I can't think of anything else that I would put in in place of these. So yeah, if you're in a similar situation to me, I mean, the, yeah, I'm gonna treat the room, but otherwise, I don't know if I could get like Grammy winning mixes on these, but in terms of getting a fairly honest representation of what's going on without having to have headphones clamped to my skull, they're really good for that. <laughs> so I'm going through all the dip switches on the side. First one being whether the, uh, the sub pack is stood up or laid down. I would imagine there's some sort of uh, acoustic properties based on which one you're doing that they compensate for. The next three are to do with exactly where you've put these in the room. Uh, in my case, it's kind of a worst case scenario, really. Being in a corner, uh, not being more than three feet or a meter away from the wall, which for traditional monitors would be an absolute death sentence. Because like, you know, the, the, the eaves that I pulled up before, wonderful speakers, 
and they've got a rear firing base port which would honk at the walls and cause massive room mode issues in that room they don't cause issues in this room because i've got that three feet plus probably four feet to the wall and there's absolutely loads of room in here that room modes are not an issue but in studio b that would be a huge problem once those three dip switches are set, we then have more dip switches for if I decide that there's too much bass, not enough bass, mid, treble, there's a 2 dB cut or boost at each position, which is nice to have so I can listen through some reference tracks and decide on what is the best for me. Then there's a couple of extra switches. One is whether it goes on standby after you've not made any sound for 20 seconds or just stays on all the time. And the other one is whether the LED's on or not. So there is a sleep and wake button on the side, which I will probably be using quite a lot because I'm chaining this through my uh, balanced headphone amp. So I don't want this all the time. I just want this to be on when appropriate. There is also a volume knob, which has a nice handy click at zero dB, which in an ideal world, I don't really want to be going above that zero dB at any point unless there's some good reason. The speakers have uh, terminals which can be screwed. I'm not sure why, because the speakers come with banana plugs attached. So you can just pop them in, which is nice and handy. And the connection points that you have on these are really quite varied. This is something that's fascinating to me. There are the TRS balanced inputs, which I'll be using uh, because that means there's minimum chance of noise uh, transferring your know, sound from the rest of my system into this. There's also a three and a half mil jack for something like a phone. Now I say a phone, there's also a USB-C port, which you can use an Android phone or a, a, an Apple iPhone. If you've got, especially for an iPhone, a USB-C to lightning uh, cable, then you can play stuff straight from uh, an iOS device, which if you're using this, you could use this with something like uh, Logic Pro for iPad and just go straight from that to this. If you don't need to record anything in, that could be a pretty good mix system, really, because that, that cuts out all the middlemen. And there's also an optical input. I'm not sure if that can do ADAT as well as SPDIF. Let's just check. Now, there's, there's, there doesn't seem to be anything in the user's manual about that, but I'm going to assume that this is SPDIF only because it's only a two-channel system. Most of the interfaces that I know that have an optical connection either are SPDIF only or there is some software switch between ADAT and SPDIF mode. So if you've got something like a, an Audient ID22 or something from one of the other manufacturers, generally speaking, you can switch that to be SPDIF optical. If you don't want to even have the risk of sending any electrical noise across cables, you can do it the other way, nice and clean. I personally am going to be using analog cables because I already have the analog output going on my desk. So looking at the specs at least, the specs say that this goes down to 47 hertz plus or minus 3 dB, which is close enough for jazz. That's pretty low. I mean, for what this is, you definitely shouldn't be expecting like 30 or 25 hertz sub out of this. I mean, it's only six inches deep at most. On the sub side, it's not as if there is room in there for a big, dedicated kind of big boy sub. And again, this isn't for that. If you are in the kind of room where you're looking at a solution like this, you are definitely going to have problems in the 30 hertz to 20 hertz range. Uh, because the lower down you go, the more problems are problems, and you really don't want that. The only spec that kind of worries me a little bit is the THD or total harmonic distortion at 85 decibels, which is fairly loud to mix. Um, it's the, the kind of the level that a lot of professional mi mixing engineers uh, tend to work at with a, a 1K test tone. Uh, then you get 3% total harmonic distortion up to almost 2 kilohertz and then 2% above that, which is quite a bit of distortion so it's not going to be the cleanest system you've ever used at that volume level but then when i'm doing detail mixing i tend to mix a lot lower down than that anyway more like 75 db or 70 really kind of almost on the verge of kind of talking quiet talking level 
uh, because then you're not getting affected by the the loudness of kind of oh this is great if you want that then you need big speakers and if you need big speakers then you're back to the problem of room treatment and you're on a whole different path to what these are for so often i see people sending mixes either to me or to guys like glenn fricker or trey xavier and there are massive issues that don't really stem from your ability as a mixer but they stem from your um, ability to hear what is being presented to you because your speakers are usually far too big for the room and are causing massive uh, room modes and nodes and peaks and dips and kind of lying to you because the room is interfering and giving you the wrong impression and you're making your decisions based on bad information. So I think the hope with something like this is that if you mix at a reasonable level with these and don't go crazy with the volume, uh, have it tuned properly to your room and go the extra step like I, I did with Sonarworks. That's something I would recommend. Um, again, I'm not being sponsored by Sonarworks. That's just something I, I've been... I paid for Sonarworks years ago and it's paid for itself. Um, so it's something that will really kind of, I think, give you uh, a lot more breathing room, so to speak, than headphones. I've got used to working on headphones, uh, but now the ability for me to switch between the two without having to do the you know, hour and a half round trip to my studio, which is what I have to deal with, uh, is going to be an absolute blessing for me. Uh, even if it is a better solution for me to come into the big control room and you know use the big monitors which is what I do when I can with big important projects just being able to check stuff on the UNF system which definitely needs a better name come on um, that is going to help me massively so yeah like I said this isn't a review I, I can't just say this is better than everything else or anything like that but I do have to say what is there out there that 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 competes with this I mean there are other companies that do smaller monitors like I said that some of them have a surprisingly kind of you know deep bass response and you know, quite a shocking amount of level to be honest but I don't think there's much out there that does what these do they're not the cheapest. Uh, currently, I think they're on sale in the UK at about £550, so we're looking at $600, $650, that kind of range. But for what this is, if you're in a compromised uh, room situation and you can't spend huge amounts of money on room treatment, which is usually where I would recommend people spend their money first, if there's any reason why you can't do that, or at least can't do a lot of that, then... Yeah, check these out. Thanks everybody for watching. I hope you found this useful, whether you were looking at something like this or not, or whether you'd even heard of them before. Um, thanks to all the patrons on Patreon for helping me to make the everything else here a, a possibility. It's massively appreciated. Uh, there's a Discord server. Check out the link below if you want to come and have conversations, ask questions, get involved with our community. Thanks again to Cali Audio for sending these over. These are now going to be a permanent fixture in my Studio B mix room and uh, there is a big video coming about these white beasties and the other six of them which you cannot see atmos baby <laughs> thanks everybody i'll see you in the next video goodbye